I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Strengthening Human Rights Through Youth Engagement, featuring five Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellows. Catherine Kanabahita to my immediate right from Uganda. Next to her is Dolgion Aldar from Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Next to her is Marvi Sirmed from Pakistan. Next in line is Pedro Vaca Villarreal from Colombia. And finally, Victoria Tulinieva from Kazakhstan. As many of you may know, the Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellows Program is an international exchange program that brings to NED some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, journalists, and scholars to conduct independent research and outreach projects here at the NED. Since our inception in 2001, we have hosted more than 300 fellows from over 90 countries. And within this remarkable group, our speakers today stand out for their unwavering commitment to deepening civic participation in often inhospitable political environments. Catherine is executive director of DENIVA, and let's make sure I get the acronym correctly. It's the Development Network of Indigenous Voluntary Associations, DENIVA, a coalition of 700 civil society groups working across Uganda to strengthen civil society. Dolgion is the co-founder, former CEO, and board member of the Independent Research Institute of Mongolia, one of your country's leading think tanks focusing on issues of good governance and analysis of social issues. Marvi is a human rights defender, journalist. She's a member of the Executive Council of the National Human Rights Commission of Pakistan and board chair of Bites for All, a digital rights organization. Pedro is the head of FLIP, Foundation for Press Freedom in Bogota that seeks to advocate for press freedom and combats media censorship and attacks on press freedom in Colombia. And finally, Victoria is the project director of the Almaty Office of Freedom House in Kazakhstan. We're holding today's event in commemoration of International Human Rights Day. It was on this day in 1948 that the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark document that enshrined in international law the rights of every individual to fundamental human freedoms, including freedom of expression and association. Participation in public life, as we know, is an essential human right, and the extent of youth participation in public life is of special interest to us today in keeping with this year's theme for International Human Rights Day, which is youth standing up for human rights. The format for today's event will be as follows. In the first hour, I invite our speakers to address this topic in response to some key questions from myself. And then for the remainder of our time, I'll invite the audience members to ask the speakers questions. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at Think Democracy <coughs> and the endowment at NEDemocracy. Let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved in preparing for today's event, especially Ryan Arick, Anna Gakadembi, Laura Newmayer, and Alex El Nagdi. And finally, before we begin, please take a moment to silence your cell phones if you have not already done so. Thank you. Okay, so I will turn to each of you, starting with you, Catherine, but invite each of you to address an opening set of questions, which has to do with the nature of youth engagement and the extent of youth engagement in political life, in civic life, in your respective countries. So if you could just briefly, in a couple of minutes or less, tell us in the context of your political settings, um, what is the extent of youth involvement and what is the nature? Is it more organic, spontaneous, or are we seeing youth involved through more formalized channels through civil society or other formal mechanisms. Let's start with you, Catherine. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Uganda is a country that has never experienced a peaceful transfer of power from one president to another. And the current president who has been in power for the last 33 years is using all forms of uh, human rights violations and corruption and and an authoritarian rule to keep the grip on power. And he has changed the constitution 
by removing the term limits to and, and the age limits to ensure that he remains president for life. And so this is a country that is really under siege and with a future that is very bleak. And so how are we engaging, and especially the youth, to challenge such an authoritarian uh, rule? And the youth comprise about 78% of our population, of about 43 or 3 million people. So 78% is a huge number of, 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 of people to deal with. And they are in different forms of activism. Um, like gender, youth is mainstreamed in our laws and policies, but the challenge is always in implementation. And as you know, in a country like Uganda, with endemic corruption and patronism and, patron and patronage, then the provisions for gender mainstreaming and youth mainstreaming in constitutions and, inst and institutions is heavily influenced by the political elite and the government. And so, uh, this is better. And mm -hmm. so the way the youth are engaged in one way is through uh, really sitting on the fence. There's a lot of indifference and apathy because they fear for their lives. Yeah? Human rights violations include uh, <coughs> arrests like Stella <coughs> Nyanzi, a professor at Makerere University was arrested for writing a poem criticizing the government and the Museveni and the wife. So she's been in jail for the last two years. And so, and of course, uh, 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 torture, and, 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 and so they feel that they need to, to, to sit back and just watch, and, 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 and that apathy is really mainly among the urban youths. And also there is the issue of um, other youths who are being used to entrench a dictatorship because unemployment is very high, and so they hang on to the whoever can provide any money. And, and they are being used sometimes in the militia and against uh, people who have been into opposition. Other youths are used, uh, they work hard as human rights defenders. In this case, I want to cite out the group called The Alternative, who were courageous enough to throw yellow painted pigs in parliament to make a protest about uh, the evil that the MPs were doing by allowing, giving themselves huge allowances at the expense of the, the poor masses. And also the young people like Semakade and Aaron who are uh, into public interest litigation as a form of social justice. So those are the kind of youths that we work with as NGOs. And these are youths who are also in formal institutions. They have their own organizations and they work closely with the NGOs. Then there's another group of youth which is coming up, and these are the, group, the youth activists. It's not uh, formal structured, but they are taking Uganda by storm, and they are led by the People Power Movement, led by Honorable Robert Chagulani. I'm sure most of you have heard about him. And this is a group that, as NGOs, we are looking at how do we engage with citizens, how do we partner with these kind of groups. So these different shades of youth engagement is what is available, or what we can see on the landscape of Uganda. Thank you, Catherine. Um, let's turn now to Dolgion to give us a sense of the nature and extent of youth engagement in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. um, unlike Uganda, uh, Mongolia today ranks as a free country according to the Freedom Index, civil liberty and uh, political rights uh, indexes are relatively well off. Uh, having said that, youth, in overall youth's role in democracy has been critical since the first establishment of Mongolia. This exact day, 30 days ago in 1989, a couple of uh, youth demonstrated in front of the youth palace to uh, bring down the political system at the time there was communism, which later on led to a democratic, peaceful revolution. So although some people argue that, of course, the uh, regime change was inevitable because it was happening all over the country. I really believe that the youth helped leading to a peaceful transition and they really steered the will. But 30 days later, today, although we are uh, on paper uh, enjoying a lot of uh, freedom and all sorts of uh, allowance for policies, 
uh, there's still a lot of issues we face, especially there's a uh, wide range of youth, majority of the youth that do not participate in political and civil uh, life in Mongolia. So this can be seen from different voter turnout. The youth number of youth who go and vote is always double uh, lower than those who are aged above 60 who are politically very active. So this echoes the situation here in the US or in the UK or elsewhere in the world. Of course, having said that, there are some uh, youth, some uh, groups that are very active in LGBT rights, women's rights, <coughs> environmental uh, rights, and <coughs> currently there are movements, youth movements in politics called OHAI, for example. So we see a contrast of some youth being very active, especially urban youth, and majority of the youth that are not participating both in civic and so now we have to ask a question in contrast to Uganda. Although we have rights on paper, why where the youth are not majority are not participating? Thank you, Dolgion. And in round two, I will invite you to elaborate upon this and why there is this disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, Marvi, the situation as you see it in Pakistan today as it regards youth engagement. Thank you very much, Zaxis. And um, not very unlike Uganda, Pakistan is also a country with a really checkered history on, uh, as far as democracy is concerned. There have been military regimes, and when there were not military regimes, there were proxy military regimes, uh, which is the situation right now as well. But in 2017, there was a census. And according to the census, 64% uh, of Pakistan uh, Pakistani population consisted of people under the age of 30 years. 54 million people uh, in Pakistan are between the ages 15 to 29. And uh, th this indicates a huge youth bulge. And this is one reason why over recent years Pakis in Pakistan, youth engagement has been a buzzword. And uh, not only the government, but political parties and civil society organizations, everyone is uh, sort of um, you know, obsessed with youth engagement. And youth engagement, you, there, there, are, there are a bunch of youth festivals, youth conventions, there's youth parliament. But one thing that is lacking in, in, in this entire youth engagement framework is uh, political uh, um, engagement of youth. There are no student unions in Pakistan. Um, in the local government, um, the local governments are in place, but there is very sh small window for Pakistani youth to actually meaningfully participate in that uh, in that avenue as well. Um, mostly, um, but it doesn't mean that the government does not have schemes for programs and policies. Three of the four provinces have uh, youth um, policies in place. Uh, Pakistani government has, um, uh, has initiated several programs over the years to, for example, support uh, young people in their academic prowess. For example, the laptop scheme, where they offer laptop to the bright students um, they, um, uh, without cost. Uh, then there is this program, Jawan Pakistan, which, is, which offers loans to the young grads so that they come, uh, they actively participate in the economic activity. Uh, then there is a, a another wide na nationwide program, national internship program, where the students have an opportunity to work with public sector organizations, institutions, and ministries, and they gain experience. And uh, there are youth parliaments as well, but they are mostly um, run by, <coughs> led by the civil society organizations. So I think this is there is youth engagement, and there two, three type of youth engagement. One is the one led by the state, the other is led by the civil society. Both are occasional and normative in nature. And uh, I call them cosmetic, because if, if you young people do not have opportunity to actually participate in political processes, uh, nothing is going to happen. And this is why one reason why uh, over the last two years, young people have actually stood up for their rights. Uh, for example, you can see in Pashtun Tahafuz movement um, uh, in Aurat March, in very recent, two weeks ago, there was this uh, student march. There are professional organizations like Young Doctors Association, uh, Young Women Journalists Association. But um, I mean, it amazes me that all of these young, uh, you know, youth initiatives are being viewed um, uh, you know, with the government in a very negative way. And they, um, uh, most of them are being charged uh, with sedition uh, accusations. So 
this is how the youth is being engaged by the state of Pakistan. There seems to be a somewhat of a divide between the more formalized, top-down <coughs> initiatives That's from right. the government or civil society versus the more spontaneous, organic, bottom-up approaches yeah, from the youth. From the youth themselves. That's right. Thank you, Marvi. Let's turn now to Pedro to shed light on the situation of youth engagement in Colombia. Thanks, Sarshis, and thanks also, Annette, for for taking this opportunity of the Human Rights Day to talk about you, youth and democracy. So just to share a sense of what is happening in Colombia now, we are in the third week of a national strike uh, with uh, a lot of participation of, of, of young people. And with that said, I mean, as a, as a frame of something that is happening now, uh, I think that the causes, I mean, I, I think that young people is very active, is very involved. They have an interest on public uh, discussion. Uh, they also have a lot of causes, and, and those causes are dispersed, are not sharp at all. Uh, but all of those causes are linked with human rights. No? So inequality, uh, armed conflict or peace, in, in, in the case of our country, uh, corruption, uh, education, uh, LGBTI rights. So all of those causes are linked and are not, I mean, the, the, the traditional struct, uh, structure of right and left is not enough to handle and to tackle and understand what is happening in our countries. And if you look to some other countries in Latin America, it's almost the same, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Honduras, Mexico. I think that young people want to be part of a group that is able to make change. I think, uh, and they have good purposes. They want a better future and uh, they want to be part of that. A third element that for me is really important and that probably we are not looking as deep as it should be is the anxiety of young people. They feel anxious and uh, they want that change now. They, they, they are not able to wait. They, they do not want to wait for that change. They want it now and it's dispersed. And, 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 and I think that's a rhythm that goes against, against the, the common way in which democracies have deal with this. No? So if, if you say we, we need a democratic change, so it, it used to take longer than the rhythm and the portion of time that young people is able to handle or want to handle. Uh, and the last thing, I mean, just for this brief uh, introduction, I think that mm, those, I mean, th the youth that is getting involved in public, in that public sphere, it's also easy captured by polarization. No? So we have two sides of the coin, black and white, red and, uh, uh, right and left, sorry, and uh, young people is easy captured and they get into those echo chambers where they think they are talking to so many people, but they are talking to themselves and they are talking to the, their relatives. And I think that, that we have a lack of uh, discussion, we have a lack of debate, we have a lot of polarization, but we have a mass of young people that is really interested in our future. Thank you, Pedro. Very interesting. And now, last but not least, Victoria, if you could tell us a bit about the nature of youth engagement and the extent of youth engagement in public life in Kazakhstan. Yeah, sure, Zeb, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, and happy Human Rights Day. So turning to Kazakhstan, um, in my understanding, the uh, involvement uh, of youth into civic initiatives aimed to, uh, to hold the government accountable is very poor, very limited. Um, and here I would like to stress the wooden civic initiatives aim to hold the government accountable because in principle youth is uh, pretty active, actively participate in some other public initiative, but mostly those initiatives which uh, aim to help the government, especially to help the government to run in the uh, program of social importance. And uh, although it is, you know, very important to help the government, but it's equally important to hold the government accountable. And unfortunately, those social importance programs are not uh, connected to human rights agenda and democratization agenda in, in the country. And um, the voice of, uh, of, of the youth in uh, human rights programs and in initiatives is very, very, very spontaneous and not vocal, unfortunately. Although in public initiatives, uh, let's say, raised and uh, orchestrated by the government, it is vocal. Thank you, Victoria. 
So now I'd like to go in a little more depth with respect to each of your countries and political settings. And I'll start with you, Catherine. Um, and then I will turn to Victoria because it follows a certain pattern that you will discern. But I know from our conversations, you have noted that um, in Uganda, there's a regime in place for 33 years. The Museveni regime has shown no signs of making an exit. It has mounted campaigns of disinformation, poisoning the minds of people about the very important work of civil society. Um, and so ordinary citizens, as I understand, are disconnected, alienated from civil society. And what you and Deniva and the groups you work with are doing are seeking to help to bridge that gap between civil society and ordinary citizens. Could you tell us in some ways how you're seeking to bridge that gap and how you seek to reclaim the narrative about the very worthwhile work of civil society in Uganda? Um, oh, you turned it on. Keep it on. It's on. Leave it on throughout. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's true. The NGOs in Uganda are under an oppressive dictatorial regime. Uh, and the narrative about us is that we are agents of foreign governments, we're agents of terrorists, and even involved in money laundering. So a number of our NGOs have been, you know, attacked and and they are, you know, broken in and computers confiscated, information collected, leaders are some of them arrested and and accounts frozen for action aid. So we've had these experiences in the last more so uh, three, four years. And the situation is really not improving because we are nearing the 2021 elections and there's a lot of tension in the country. And so the citizens, especially the youth who do not know any other government because Museveni has been in for th 33 years and the youth are 35 years and less. And so they don't know a change in government. And they are under fear and terror because of what they see around. And so building that bridge of trust and trying to project a positive image that we are worth a group of organizations working to work with is a challenge. Also, the government's negative portrayal of our NGOs has made uh, the society think we're anti-government. Because the narrative is we're actually agents bring in different ideas that are against government. And so for we are trying to fight against that because it's not right. And we are building on to how to portray a positive image, more like a, an, a, a PR machinery that we have to put in place. And we realize that we have to go back to our constitution, the policies, the acts, the laws. They give us our legitimacy and our mandate we usually hear the government asking, whom do you speak for? On, on which, whose behalf are you doing all these campaigns? And so we have to go back to the books. Which constitution is changing for its own benefits? And we're trying to say this is our constitution and we're going to build onto that constitution and stand on that constitution and use it to advocate for our contribution to development. And so capturing the success stories of what we've done over the years showing how much we are contributing to the budget, showing, showing how much opportunities we are giving for employment, showing the major, major contributions, especially those in service delivery, and in even in advocacy and for good governance and democracy that we are basically contributing to development. So building that positive case for us and documenting the success stories and, and advocating with empirical evidence is really the focus that we are making sure that we do and, and to, to counter that negative uh, narrative. Uh, secondly, there's the issue of coalitions and partnerships. We don't want to come out alone as an NGO, you'll be crushed. So we try to, as we advocate for different causes, that uh, the, black, uh, the Black Monday movement, like the uh, all different campaigns, we work as coalitions so that NGOs are not isolated and hit. Thirdly, we also realize that in order to criticize government or hold it to account, we need to have the moral authority to do that. We do not want to pretend that we are above corruption or that we have integrity in all organizations. So we have created a self-regulatory mechanism called QAM. It's the NGO uh, certification mechanism that assesses NGOs and accredits them based on a set of 60 standards. 
So based on that, we ensure credibility, professionalism, and ethical behavior within our own NGO sector. And finally, we're trying to find innovative ways of bridging the gap between the NGOs and citizens. And on, in July, I was able to talk to some young girls, and they were keen on uh, in a focus group discussion. They were not listening. They were like far from the room where we are. So when you interrogated them more, I found that there were issues of that they were hungry, they said they were hungry, that they were, you know, uh, thinking about problems with boyfriends and domestic issues. And I realized a major lesson that is informing our work, that when <coughs> we're engaging with citizens, we need to start where they are. If we are to go to the bars, if we are going to strip the, sweep the streets, if we are going to collect garbage, that's where we need to st start. And there we'll introduce our ideas and, and issues of human rights and governance and democracy around the table, having, real, having addressed whatever issues that are on their minds. And then there, the issue of, uh, of, of togetherness, of cooperation, and of, of making sure that we visualize the Uganda we need can become an issue on the table. And finally, the messaging. How do we come out with strong messages that you can share at the national level, regional level, and international level? Thank you, Catherine. So that um, brings me to Victoria. You mentioned visualizing the Uganda that we need, which corresponds with um, the work that Freedom House has been doing in Kazakhstan in introducing a civic education course called Imagining Kazakhstan. And I'd like to invite you, Victoria, to share with us a bit more about why Freedom House chose civic education as a tool to bridge the gap between civil society and ordinary citizens. Um, what did that course look like? How was it implemented in Kazakhstan? Um, who were the audiences and what was the impact of this course that Freedom House led? Yes, thank you, Zaxaris. Um, in Kazakhstan, we decided to address the problem of, uh, a problem of youth disengagement through the civic education on two major reasons. First, because the government doesn't provide any uh, civic education within the uh, state-running classes. And second reason why we decided to do so is that the pro-democracy NGO community is also doesn't offer regular engagement with the youth. So we anticipated uh, civic education as a tool for regular engagement of pro-democracy community in Kazakhstan with the youth. Uh, for this purpose, we developed a cycle of civic education, not even the course, but the cycle. The cycle starts with the uh, brief talks about activism and human rights with the youth, then continues with Imagine in Kazakhstan course of civic education, and ends with uh, small stipends program and fellowship programs for the youth in pro-democracy NGOs. The core part of the cycle is the course, which is called Imagining Kazakhstan. And the title is not random, actually, because through the course, we wanted our students to imagine their future for Kazakhstan as a democratic country and would like to complete the course with this particular vision of the country uh, I I in their minds, in their heads. The course uh, by itself is a very unique product for Kazakhstan, I would rather say, because it's based on participatory approach of pedagogy, when our uh, students, not just uh, you know, passive listeners, what the trainers uh, tell about, but uh, they are actively engaged into shaping their learning. And this is full five days discussions about values, about uh, skills and knowledge and action required for active citizenship. And for youth, the mm, course, let's say, helps to mm, develop critical thinking, reasoning with facts rather than emotions, and to be tolerated to pluralism, to different views. For us, for community, pro-democracy community, for NGOs, it is a platform, it is a stage to demystify some, you know, stereotypes, student stereotypes about free assembly, free belief, about the democracy, about LGBT rights, about pro-democracy NGOs, which are, uh, in my country, are, let's say, frequently portrayed by uh, official media in very negative uh, uh, colors, using very negative narratives, unfortunately. Thank you, Victoria. 
So let's turn now to the situation in Pakistan, and I'd like to pose three questions to you, Marvi. The first has to do with civic education. To what extent are civil society organizations in Pakistan running civic education courses? Um, the second has to do with the issue of gender. If you could speak to how women, young women, are involved in civic participation in Pakistan. And the third question has to do with combating extremism. Um, to what extent are youth engaged in combating violent extremism in Pakistan? Yes, um, I mean, these are three long questions, um, but I'll try my best to. Um, well, uh, I think uh, civil, the role of civil society has been really important as far as all these three themes are concerned. Uh, in terms of civic education, uh, uh, I think civil society organization took an initiative um, before the government could think about civic education. Um, and um, uh, I it was just, it was I think 2018 when the government uh, um, uh, passed the, you know, government presented the bill for uh, the National uh, Civic Education Commission. It has been passed uh, in 2018. It was passed by the parliament, but it is di lying dormant. Um, uh, but uh, civil society organizations have been running a bunch of programs, which are, well, occasional in the sense that they are uh, time bound, because most of them, actually all of them, are donor funded. Um, international uh, partner do development partners are funding these programs. but. That's why I say our international development partners need to be patient. Change does not come in two years or three years projects. I mean, th 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 these initiatives need to be um, sustained and uh, sustained for a period of time so that they produce results. They need to be designed as such. Uh, so that is one reason why uh, civil society organizations start something and then leave it somewhere. For example, youth parliaments. Youth parliament started in 2007. The project ended in 2017 after 10 years. but. It was a huge success uh, in the sense that now uh, uh, young people are electing their own youth parliaments uh, as a shadow parliament working um, in parallel to, to the parliament of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, it, it has done a lot in terms of uh, civic education and political education of, of young people. Uh, in terms of gender also, I think things are getting better. They are not as, uh, I mean, uh, absolutely desirable, but they are gradually getting better because of the um, all credit to international uh, partners again, because every program had mainstreamed gender, incorporated gender aspect in it. And now, after so many years of, of working with government of Pakistan and civil society of Pakistan, I think even the government uh, and the parliament are quite conscious of the fact that gender um, uh, aspect of every policy and every program has to be considered. Um, extremism is a very, well, uh, quite a tricky question because um, at, at one point, uh, at, uh, at one hand, um, uh, pa the state of Pakistan is running five to seven uh, centers for de-radicalization in which former Taliban are being de-radicalized and they are being taught, um, you know, uh, curricula that are different from Pakistani schools. So why the rest of pa the rest of Pakistani schools are studying the same curricula that radicalized them in the first place? So I think every school, every college, every university needs to be a de-radicalization center. Uh, but uh, at one hand, this this is happening. At the other hand, government is booking um, uh, students on sedition charges when they raise voice against the atrocities, uh, military. Um, led atrocities in the uh, the terrorism hit areas. Uh, uh, I mean, but but I think uh, this is um, th this is a responsibility of all of us, the civil society, the the government, and the international partners. One thing that I would uh, you know just before I I close my uh, my argument, uh, international partners, we are very grateful to for example, UK government for uh, helping Malala and her family the way they did. And it was not possible. The poor girl would have lost her life if uh, there was not this help. Uh, so really, really grateful. But on the other hand, um, one UK funded mega program, mega education program that ran in Pakistan for five years 
tried its best to disassociate itself from Malala Yousafzai just because the extremist elements in Pakistan have associated Malala with very negative kind of an, uh, of an image. So in order to save the, their image, they disassociate themselves with Malala. And in doing that, they were actually perpetuating those stereotypes that are actually not only harming Malala, but all the progressive voices in Pakistan. So I think uh, all of us need to be in sync. And uh, uh, whatever we say, we preach, we need to incorporate it in our entire work, not just one youth program. Thank you, Marvi. So in reflecting on what you've said, it's such an unfortunate circumstance that a uh, voice as courageous as Malala has been one that even international partners feel the need within the country to disassociate <laughs> themselves from because she has been maligned by yeah. forces within the country. And this, in a way, speaks to the issue that I know Pedro is confronting in Colombia, as we all are across the globe, with the rise of technology platforms, social media. We're seeing a proliferation of not just information, but also disinformation. And I'd like to invite you, Pedro, to speak to how you and your Foundation for Press Freedom in Colombia are grappling with the outsized role of technology, the rise of inf disinformation online, and how to combat that. Thank you, Sarsis. Um, I think that the whole ecosystem of information and content has changed so fast. And we haven't had the chance to even understand how it is and how this is going to be. Uh, I think we're a little bit obsessed with technology and what we call digital democracy. And I would like first to, to invite you all to, to distinguish two scenarios. The first one is the unplugged people. Uh, those areas that are not connected, those rural or isolated zones where there's no media offer, in those municipalities where there's where if there was a TV station, probably is going to close soon because the uh, business model is, seems that it's not working anymore. We uh, started three years ago a project that is titled uh, inf Information Cartographies. So we went to each municipality of Colombia to, to look, at, I mean, it's like a census of media. So we know for each municipality how many me media outlets they have, how, how many of those are digital, and for example, one of the things that we didn't know that, that was happening in our country is the huge portion of military broadcasting. I mean, in Colombia, the most important public media is the Minister of Defense. More, more than 100 frequencies in hands of the police and the military. In, in some areas, they are the only voice. I do not have anything against military broadcasting. What I really scared about is if they are the only voice in a rural area. So uh, with that said, we, we, we noticed that at least a quarter of the population of Colombia live in uh, areas where there's no local media offer. And why, why is this important for your question, Sergis? It's because in those areas where there is not media offer, it's easy, it's, it's easy for this information to, be, to succeed. No? And and those uh, studies, those research are, are, are being, for example, here in the US, th if you put media, I mean, media deserts, that arc, you will find those municipalities where, where there is no media offer and where there is a lack of local democracy. Uh, what are we doing for, for tackling that? <coughs> we created an itinerant journalism school, which is a container that goes through these areas to put people in touch, to put leadership in touch with journalism and local democracy. And the second thing, and, 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 and I finish with this, is I think that the people that is plucked, the, the people that is living this digital democracy, uh, we have like two, two groups of them. The first one is those that people that is able and that is encouraged to participate and they are easy captured by polarization. No? And they are expert on trolling, for example. No? And then you have an, another portion of youth and young people that wants to participate but is a skirt. There's a lot of self-censorship. There's a lot of young people that is looking at the news that is related with LGBT rights and that they try to write a tweet and they say, okay, no, much I prefer not to publish this because if, if I publish this, 
I'm going to be a victim of harassment or something. So we have a lot of people that is plugged, but is not participating, and they want to. But internet and some, uh, some social media are not a safe place for youth to participate. Thank you, Pedro. Um, and then finally, let me turn to Dolgion in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, Dolgion, that in Mongolia we have democracy on paper, but not in practice and you were sharing with us that there seems to be some disengagement on the part of youth towards democracy. So can you elaborate upon that? Why is it that democracy does not seem to be delivering in Mongolia? Why are the youth frustrated by the bureaucratic or political processes that are in place? Mm -hmm. I can agree with you when you say youth, why the youth are frustrated. Uh, last year, we conducted a nationwide survey on social well-being in Mongolia and found out that 85% of the youth, so that's people from 18 to 35 years old, were uh, very dissatisfied with the current social and economic situation. So that says majority of the youth are very unhappy. But we did another survey about their knowledge uh, about local elections, if they have heard of local councils, have they participated in local um, public hearings and things like that? And maximum 10% of the youth have engaged in such everyday political activities. So this sh this is there is a huge gap. Why huge dissatisfaction, but very low levels of political and civic engagement? So I think, in addition to, of course, what my colleagues shared, two main uh, reasons. Just yesterday, uh, sorry, before saying that I want to share, a few days ago, a prominent Mongolian influencer on Twitter wrote, uh, that was tweeted so many times, youth in Mongolia are failing us because they're not reading, they're not uh, going and voting or being active, and they're not changing anything. They're just sitting quietly. That's why I'm not worried about the elderly. I'm worried about the youth who are not participating in taking change. So I read that and of course I was furious <laughs> and I'll tell you why I felt very furious. So first of all in Mongolia compared to similar economies the number of the proportion of youth that are uh, idle so wha what I mean by idle is youth who are not educating themselves or who are not uh, employed or not contributing to their household activities or things like that is very high. So we call this neat youth, not in education, training and employment. So this rate is very high. And whereas 30 years ago, when the youth of 30 years ago was demonstrating things like that, they had their housing, they had full-time employment, they had all the everyday uh, needs already met. So then you can start worrying about changes and things like that. Whereas in Mongolia, poverty is still very high. Youth comprise the largest number among the unemployed people. So this showed that the government has failed to deliver to the youth. So now people my age, they already have, some of my friends have four kids, three children that they have to care, take care, and when they can go and participate. So that's the deep socioeconomic inequality and poverty issue. <coughs> but on the other hand, the process, when we ask the youth about the public hearing or council meeting, nobody have heard of, but all of them heard of things like TED Talk, even in rural areas. And when I, I gave ta uh, a TED Talk in 2017, I thought uh, not many people will show up because it was Saturday morning, 9 a.m., and there were 1,000 young people. So when the message is relevant to the youth, the audience is relevant maybe, and the platform, the forum is interesting, youth are ready to participate. Like Pedro said, people are interested, youth are interested, but it is they just don't engage because the political processes we have are so bureaucratic and very, very not up to date. For example, if we want to submit one complaint to a government agency, we have to write this uh, A4 letter and type the sincerely or signature in certain places, go to the place, submit it, wait for 30 days, 
we might or might not get a response. Who would do that nowadays when we tweet and do use social media and all those things? So clearly there's a mismatch between what the political and bureaucratic processes are telling the youth to do to engage and what the youth want. So it's really time for uh, the political system to adapt to current age and rethink maybe hundreds of years of uh, legal laws that they trans transported from abroad uh, in 1800s again. So that's my thing. And I want to also say something. To in response to this person who tweeted uh, that youth are failing us, I want to say <coughs> probably the political system and the government is failing us. And I want to quote Lipset who says, um, if some groups are denied access to political processes, especially new democracies, the legitimacy of the system is in question. So the youth rejecting to participate and distrusting the government and not finding the correct ways to have access to politics is the sign of the legitimacy of the current government. True, very true. Thank you, Dolkion. You know, reflecting on what you said and what uh, Marvi said, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the youth in Mongolia, and it's true across the globe, the youth expecting instantaneous results. Whereas Marvi said, please have patience with us because democracy cannot be delivered overnight. It takes time. It's not going to happen in one or two years even. And so there appears to be perhaps you could call it a generational divide between the young expecting results right away and older generations accustomed to a more deliberative, protractive process of democratic engagement. Um, there's the other divide, the urban versus the rural divide, even among youth. There is the digital divide that Pedro mentioned between those who are plugged and those who are unplugged. Um, there's the gender issue that Marvi, you touched upon. Um, socioeconomic divide between the wealthy, the elite, who may be more engaged, whereas the ones who are living in media deserts, who are perhaps uninformed and disengaged. And so in the last round of questions, I'd just like each of you to address, in seeking to bridge some of these divides, what can civil society do? What can democratically oriented civil society actors do to deepen youth engagement, to deepen civic engagement in your respective societies? And if there is one sign of hope that you can point to as it relates to youth engagement, what might that sign of hope look like? And let's start with you, Marvi. Um, well, f for me, uh, what is happening in the last two years is quite, uh, it's, it's big hope. Aurat March is a big hope. Student, uh, students March two weeks ago, big hope. Um, PTM itself is a big hope. Uh, so there's a, the, uh, and PTM is one um, uh, movement that brings together urban and rural youth uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, you, you can see them together, um, which, which is one point where civil society of Pakistan has not been able to, neither government, uh, they have not been able to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, touch that, that, that point because most of the, um, the programs, they are um, targeting the students. Uh, most of the youth programs run by the government are targeting the students student loans, uh, stu laptops to students, internship programs for students. Now, where are, where are the 54% uh, uh, young people who are out of school, out of universities, out of colleges? What about 60% of the young people who are living in the rural areas? How do we engage? So where is the plan to engage them? Where, 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 where are the tools to engage them? The, 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 they, they are not in the in educational institutions, so they won't be in student unions. Their student unions are not there uh, anyway in Pakistan. So uh, I think the, 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 the some thinking needs to be put there. Uh, uh, and hope is also there because young people from rural areas are out there r standing up for their rights. Um, I think this is high time that the state of Pakistan thinks about um, organized uh, youth engagement uh, in terms of uh, involving youth in the local government system, 
um, uh, opening avenues for, for young people to be part of the active political process, electoral process, and uh, reinstate student unions, for heaven's sake. I mean, why this is one thing that trains young people who are part of the education system uh, to, to, to uh, contribute in the political processes. If, if young people are not able to contribute to them, to participate in political policy making, how are they, uh, I mean, uh, how, how are the policies going to address their issues? And how, the, how do we uh, sleep, uh, you know, in comfort thinking that we have engaged youth without, you know, uh, giving them any uh, opportunity to participate politically? Thank you, Marvi. Let's turn now to Victoria. Do you see any signs of hope in terms of youth participation in political life in Kazakhstan? Yes, uh, for the time being, I see some sign of hope for the country. Um, from from the youth engagement, especially from the uh, those youth movement that appeared to, to be in the country after the snap presidential election of this year, because the word seems like three new youth movements appeared uh, after the June this year, uh, Oyan Kazakhstan, Respublika Kaharman, and they were pretty active and still is. Uh, and they were pretty active also in terms of the protesting against the float uh, election of this year. And um, it seems like they have pro-democracy agenda and the will to pursue it. Uh, and it really gives hope, excited um, for me, excited for me and promising. But at the same time, um, I, I think that possible changes or the ability to make difference by those movements is highly dependent on the way how they succeed to get more particip participation from another youth, from another uh, population, and to ensure extensive and uh, diverse participation from the population at large. If they succeed to do this, then it will increase the chan uh, chances to make difference in the country. I mean, more participation, more chances to make difference. Thank you, Victoria. And now to you, Catherine. Any signs of hope as it relates to youth engagement in civil society and political life in Uganda? Yes, I think the youth have actually given us the hope. Because after M7, he changed the constitution to ensure he's in for life as a president. And after he ensured that the Electoral Commission is hand-picked hand and always rigs those elections that he's had in the previous years for elections. And after the judiciary and the parliament and the executive are not separated, where there's no separation of powers, I think he, he reached a point and of course accumulating so much wealth and having his wife as Minister of Education and his family, uh, including the son as uh, general in the army, I think they thought they had set up a stage where they will control the country until they feel like changing another leader to one of them. But the youth are not sitting down. They have stood up and are pushing back. And that's why we're so proud of the People Power Movement, because they're very courageous. They have been harassed. Some have been killed. Some are arrested under treason charges. But they are waking up every day wearing the red berets, wearing their they are ha they are red clothes and, 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 and fighting on. And for us, that is really our source of hope. And that's why we like using red pens <laughs> as we do our work. Because we remember what the sacrifices the youth are doing right back home. That is one major source of, uh, of hope. The second source of hope is the national dialogue. That is at around this table where everybody is sitting. Because we're shaking up the status quo. Museven is scared and he's lost so, so much weight if you've seen him of late. And so we, we're saying there's a way out. Yeah, don't panic. Yeah, and let's sit around the table and talk. And so as the youth are pushing from the different corners, the elders, the NGOs, the religious leaders, the uh, political parties, the government itself around the corner in a national dialogue trying to find solutions for our country. The problem with that is 
the national dialogue has currently been hijacked by the president himself. He signed the communique for it, and he said there's nobody who's supposed to finance this national dialogue. He said, I am going to finance it myself, the government only, so that he can make sure he controls it. And so far, we, it hasn't had so many meetings because it's all under his mercy. But now within that dialogue, there are many forces that are saying, no, this is supposed to be a citizens-led process. It's not a government, NRM government-led process. It's not a president-led process. It is a citizens-led process. Citizens are demanding to talk. We don't want to go back to war. We are tired of war. We, ca we want to dialogue. We want to talk. We want to find solutions. So that's what is happening now on the ground, the pulling and the pushing. And it's in that process, I think there lies the hope. The young people are taking leadership. They are pushing hard and checking and shaking the status quo. And even for some of us who may not feel, look young anymore, but I, young at heart and in mind, yeah? We are calling upon ourselves to make sure that we are part of this process. We drag our old bodies <laughs> and we make our voices and our presence felt and we fight on and fight on until I realize democracy, not only in Africa, but even, not only in Uganda, but even the wider Africa, there are major, major challenges to that. And I'd like to end with a quotation by, from Richard of the Earth, from Franz Fanon, who says, every generation must out of relative obscurity discover its historical mission and either fulfill it or betray it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, very inspiring. And so we turn now to Pedro and to invite you to share with us signs of hope as it relates to youth engagement in civic life in Colombia. Thanks, Ashish. I, I will try something. If, if we should put like a full name of what I think is should happen to freedom of expression is if the name should be, we have to keep fighting for freedom because freedom is at risk. But the last name would be we have to improve a healthy public debate. Because it's not freedom for saying disinformation, for spreading fa uh, fake content. It is, we, we should as society, we should uh, have a better conversation as the years goes on. And I think we are not on that time, but we <laughs> should work on that direction. And I mean, I'm, I'm not optimistic. But I would say that if we do some things, probably I would become optimistic. Mm. One of, th of the things I think we should start or we should improve, we have to recognize youth as an actor. You know? In the preparation of this conference, we had some, s some talks with our RAs, and I remember that Alex raised that there's an expression that is, okay, boomer. No? <laughs> And uh, uh, that's an insult to, 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 to youth participation, no? And, and I think we should recognize youth as an actor because mm, probably we are, we are n I mean, old people, I'm young. <laughs> 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 old people is the one that is not understand, is the actor that is not understanding this new wave. And more than excluding young people, we should, I mean, the, the public sphere should we be with the arms open. And I think that's not the moment, but we should work on that direction. I think that also local democracy matters. No? I mean, I think that most of our country public debates are uh, focused on the capitals. And there are a lot of things happening in other uh, scenarios that are also are part of, uh, of our decision making. Mm, I think we have to uh, start digital literacy. I mean, for me, it, I, I, I'm not an expert on that. I'm here at NET researching on that. But what for me is really clear is we, are, we invest as countries, our companies, we, we invest a lot of money in connecting people. I mean, we, we want pe as much people as possible into the digital market, but we do not invest as much money or a proportional money for education on technology. So we have a lag, we have a gap there, and we should work on that. Mm, we and, and this is my, my, my final thought. I think we also need, I mean, we have the right to dream that our, our public figures, that our relevant voices should, uh, could be a model. I mean, uh, we do not, we should not get accustomed to the, 
macho that knows it all, that has the best solution. Uh, I mean, no clap for that per person. <laughs> we, we should figure out how to build public fag figures as model of pluralism, discussion, debate, putting together ideas of others and creating and building as, uh, and make it making it stronger uh, a society. So we, we, we should work on that too. Thank you, Pedro. And um, in conclusion, <laughs> Dol Gion, share with us signs of hope as it relates to youth engagement in Mongolia. Okay. Um, overall, when I look, think about the general enabling factors, Mongolia has a lot of good factors like high literacy rate, education level, peaceful country, already democracy there, etc. So there's a strong base there. And uh, there are a few things that we need to change. First, the societal attitudes towards youth. It's like I mentioned previously, especially coming from influential and high-level politicians who see youth as, like Marvi said, either as a separate group of people who maybe can play like youth parliament there and I don't know, like can yeah. uh, be part of a project there, have their own TED Talks there, like that. So they'd like to keep their youth, youth just separate. But the youth want to be active, they want to participate, they want to be at the parliament seat. Just recently we hear about this um, uh, Finland prime minister who's 34 years old, the world's youngest prime minister, and we see that. But unfortunately these kind of cases are so rare that it doesn't resonate uh, to on a daily basis to youth. Uh, so we need to make this a reality and uh, something not rare. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to do that, of course, I have a very long list of things I would like to do. Since Christmas is coming, maybe <laughs> I should <laughs> say all of it. But uh, as someone who works in a research and think tank, the immediate thing I would like to do in the next maybe one, two years is to work with the key government agencies that are uh, providing oversight to the government like the National Audit Office, Anti-Corruption Office, Police Department, Judiciary, etc., to work with them uh, to assess, first of them, to assess them, maybe develop a youth report card to see how uh, youth-friendly their operations and processes and legal environment are, uh, just to assess that, and then maybe develop some kind of uh, strategies to improve their current engagement processes. And this is possible because many of the youth who um, express, uh, what to say, uh, some kind of dissatisfaction with the existing processes said, they went to somewhere to complain, but they never heard back. There's no accountability. So I think there's a strong chance to start with the accountability part of democracy to engage youth through ways that are using research, uh, assessment, and strategies. So that's my very short and concrete uh, proposal. But in the long term, to change the attitude of the society and to make it understand that in a society where one third of the entire population is not participating, is not, it's not normal. And just to accept that and think that it's our responsibility to engage our citizens, not just because they're youth or women or people with disabilities like that, because they're all citizens and we have to engage them. So flip the blame game and like um, my colleague Catherine said, just feel young and feel part of the society and enough with the divisive generational role area, whatever devi divisive narrative, but use this cohesive, inclusive, yeah. inclusive narrative and that's what we need in Mongolia. Thank you, Dolgian. Yeah. Thank you all for your insights. And on that inspiring note, let me turn to you in the audience to invite you to chime in with any questions that you may have. If you could kindly identify yourselves. And we have microphones around the room as well. So who would like to ask a question? OK, so we have three. We could begin with um, Vera at the back, if you could just 
introduce yourself, Vera, please, and then we'll make our way to the front. Good afternoon. I'm Vera Gogohia. I come from Georgia. Uh, I'm a former Reagan Fassel Fellow, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for this wonderful panel. You mapped, you mapped the youth, the spirit of youth throughout, from country to country through the world, and it's, I think, a very unique thing. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I have a question, which is about how do you think young people, how comfortable young people who are already active are about joining real politics, either running for offices or joining political parties? Do you think that thi that is the field that we should be pushing? And do you think do you see whether voters are ready? to vote for such young, inexperienced people. Thank you. So youth who are already active in civil society, do you think they should be encouraged to become part of political parties, yes, run. run for public office? Is there a particular speaker you would like to pose? I can actually... Marvi, yes. Or do we want to take a couple of questions and then... Why don't we take three questions <laughs> and then we can parcel them out to our speakers. So who had their hand up? Yes, next to Laura. Hi, my name is Hope Loudon. I'm a women's and children's rights advocate and a journalist. And it seems that it, it's a very pervasive um, sense of the explanations being that... Uh, youth are uneducated or disillusioned or expecting instant gratification, things like that. But one of the themes that emerged in your discussion seemed to be self-preservation, whether it's in terms of having three or four children to feed and not having employment, or being afraid to publish a tweet because of repercussions. And so I'm wondering, can civil society offer, offer youth who are politically active any protections? And what would you say to youth who are interested in becoming politically active but who are afraid? So maybe Pedro could respond to that. Youth who are interested in engaging but who for some reason or the other might have other priorities or who are afraid to engage. So Pedro, you could respond to that. And then let's take the third question from the woman in the front, please. And then we'll go to another round. Uh, hi, my name is Tatiana Peck. Um, I'm an MA student and a foreign affairs professional. I have a question to Victoria and anybody else who would like to join, writing on your question basically following that. Um, I think we have a sort of generational obstacle in Central Asia because we have a whole um, generation or two maybe of people who were somewhat traumatized by the instability of the 90s. So they come to this uh, false equivalence between um, uh, democracy of the 90s and economic instability. To bridge that, how, what would you actually say to those people who are afraid to engage because they think that that will be the trade-off? Okay, wonderful, thank you. So Marvi, would you like to respond to Vera's question about connecting youth to political parties or running for public office? Yes, thank you very much, Vera. Uh, as I understand, Vera uh, is also asking that uh, should we force them or are they already um, you know, willing to, to take on uh, the political responsibility, political offices, or uh, be in part of political process? Well, I think uh, s uh, speaking of Pakistan, I think uh, youth is very much interested in political uh, political processes. They are a very active part of political parties already in terms of uh, every political party in Pakistan has a youth wing. So these uh, young people are very actively participating in, uh, in those activities. But the problem is that these youth wings are like ghettos of, of young people. Uh, these youth wings do not... Um, uh, for example, party constitutions do not uh, make it obligatory to uh, uh, for the representation of youth wing in uh, larger um, policy making or constitution making or rule making bodies. Or maybe th there are um, in political parties there are 
um, uh, internal bodies within party uh, for uh, giving constituency tickets to people for so for campaign finance in none of these internal bodies uh, youth wings are represented so young people who um, who become part of these parties uh, with enthusiasm and with a lot of potential with the um, with the passage of time that that wears off and uh, this is also because there are no student unions before uh, more than three decades ago when student unions were there um, many um, of these many of, uh, current politicians are uh, are former student union uh, leaders so these student unions were like nurseries of political training for uh, for young people and they would then graduate to local governments and then to the provincial politics and then to the national politics and that's how uh, they would go through an entire process of training and working. Uh, but now that entire thing has, uh, has been eliminated. There are no students' unions. There are no, uh, they, they do not have any participation in local government, although they are part of the political party. So I think willingness, willingness is there, but we have, uh, you know, s somehow we have put hindrances in their way to, uh, to go further up from the point where they are in terms of political participation. Dolgion, you would like to address Vera's question as well? Yes, because I want to share an experience that's happening right now in Mongolia. We have a general election next year in 2020. So what it has been a key issue, key question. We have a lot of potential young people who have been abroad, went back to the country, but who are not really running in a, a politics for whatever reason. Uh, and we identified that this is because they feel isolated. One person running for office is very costly, both financially and also emotionally, uh, support-wise, etc. And their voice can get lost in the middle of the entire political <laughs> system. So right now, there's a uh, big movement happening in Mongolia between, regardless of the political party movement, regardless of someone is an um, active member of m uh, political party or not, around maybe 50 people, and all together they're supporting each other uh, to run and already started their campaign and uh, process. So uh, that I find very interesting that youth have reached out to each other regardless of their political divide. And on top of that, a generation of older people they formed a movement too, mm. and they their goal is to help younger, new, uncorrupt, uh, kind of pure uh, politicians to come up. So their sole purpose, some of them are uh, composers, different uh, writers, etc. So their whole agenda is to help the youth. So I find it very interesting that there's this intergenerational uh, support because and youth feel more comfortable running, not just alone, but all together. So I think in any country that's the case, and we need to, whatever we do, we have to have this coalition basis. Thank you, Dolgion. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll finish this round, and then you can respond to... Th mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I like to say in leadership, there's some experience happening in Uganda, and that is really about mentoring. Yeah, the younger people, and uh, the uniqueness with the old people and the young people being bridged so that this issue of experience is addressed in the mentoring process is very important. You, uh, Deniva is, has a project with the Alternative. It's an NGO for youth. The youth, it's not an NGO, it's a coalition of the youth, and they're working with us uh, with support from Open Society on how to build transformative leaders among the youth. So the issue of transformative leadership, because we need to, 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 to be able to change their mindsets and their attitudes and behaviors. So the whole training process is very key on transformative leadership. And also realizing that the majority of the voters are going to be youth, because for us, 80% of our population are youth. So if the youth are sensitized, they can vote for themselves and for each other. And to remind them that these leaders who are in power now were voted in when they were youth. So it's their time to vote in their fellow youth who are transformative lead leaders. Another thing is about commercialization of ele elections. There's a lot of money that is being put into 
you know, elections. And so now we realize that the, the youth don't have the money yet they need to run. So a part of our project is actually, how do you get a sponsor? How do you finance their participation? And also we are training like 300 youths in a year, but we identify like 50 who show interest and who have the capacity to stand. And we're also looking at a new phenomenon, happen phenomenon happening in Uganda with the independents. Yeah, that is the second group of candidates or representatives in parliament, second to the ruling government. So Museveni is very scared that there are going to be even more independents in parliament than his own members of parliament. So we are encouraging the youth to stand on the ticket of independence. So there's a lot of impartiality. So they can they enter politics. There's not this issue of, of allegiance to which party, because political parties have failed us. And as long as they stand on democratic, principles, then we can be supported and we can raise the, 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 the support from all kinds of networks so that the fellow youth can vote in their youth to ensure this transformative leadership in the country. Thank you, Catherine. Pedro, do you have a response to the question from Hope regarding self-preservation as perhaps an obstacle to engagement on the part who, of those who might be scared or otherwise reluctant to participate? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know if it's going to be an answer because I think it's a huge problem there. Uh, just to share an, an anecdote, I, I was like two years ago, I went to one of the biggest newsroom in, in, in Colombia for an interview about the journalism day. No. And, but I had two conversations with two different young journalists there. The first one was a, um, a, a woman that said, there's sexual harassment in this newsroom, but that is not an issue. I mean, that is something in a private conversation. And there was another journalist that said, I, I prefer not to tweet about uh, LGBTI rights because then my audience is going to feel that I do not have this neutral, uh, I mean, th this neutral model that we've built in journalism. I think there are a lot of things to do. I think we do not prevent the the self censorship, the online self censorship. Uh, I think there's a lot of emotional work we have to do. I mean, probably we, we haven't invited as much psychologists as we need in the democracy debates because we're dealing with a generation that feels a lot when <coughs> they have 200 retweets, but that feels pain and hurt when they say something and there's no reaction. So we need to develop uh, emotional skills for our young people because they, I mean, they, they balance with some metrics that are new for us. Uh, I th in the prevention side, I, I also think that if we have politicians trolling people, then we go back to the, to the model we should have. I mean, we should not get custom to uh, aggressors as leadership in public affairs. And, 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 and that's something for example, in my country, we have a lot of problems with that, mm, which is the role of the state or the role of, of the government. I think we should include in our education programs these kind of skills and because we, we are not a product, an online product. We are a citizen and we are dealing with a, with a citizenship and a public participation in social media and probably that is not a safe place for us. And also, I think media outlets have some res responsibilities because we, we fight for their freedom, but sometimes they are part of the disinformation and manipulation process, and people is not aware of this. We have to prepare our people for the emotional challenge that is, I mean, the sphere we're having now. Thank you, Pedro. And Victoria, would you like to respond to Tatiana's question about how to engage those in Kazakhstan who may be traumatized by the experience of the yeah. 1990s? Uh, sure, and thank you so much, uh, Tatiana. Uh, to your question, I also would like to, would one reason why, uh, why use uh, voice is not vocal in Kazakhstan, and I believe that Unfortunately, this is a political regime by itself with that strictly controls free expression, free assembly and association, and uh, creates some kind of fear among the population, including the youth, to be involved into some, let's say, uh, um, 
bad things for which they can be punished. And th this is obviously a problem, which we also try to address. But how? Uh, in my understanding, the best way to address this problem is peer-to-peer -peer approach. Because despite of the negative context in which uh, we live in the country, uh, we still have people, young people, who are engaged into, you know, um, I wouldn't say political activity, but let's say civic initiatives, uh, which I ma mentioned previously, aim to hold the government accountable uh, with less fear or maybe sometimes without fear. So we are, as a pro-democracy community, trying to um, connect those courage people with those who are, you, you know, have a fear to be engaged into something. And we create some kind of platforms for their discussions, for discussions among them. Because when a young girl or boy see the boy or girl of her or his age, uh, which tells about the problems in the country very passionately, very you know, openly, and say uh, that they make a difference in this country despite of the negative context, then uh, the, the, uh, the, the young boys and girls believe them much more than they believe trainers of age above, let's say, 35 or 40. So it really works, and um, we are trying to use this um, you know, opportunity to connect uh, peers among themselves and to give them uh, opportunity to talk to each other. It's diminished the fear, it diminished the, you know, um, mm, um, concerns and risks and inspire too much. Thank you, Victoria. So let us take another round of questions and we'll begin with the woman in the front to my left here who's been waiting patiently. And then to the gentleman in the middle near Laura. And do we have a third question at this time? No? OK, let's take these two. OK. Uh, Reni Trykova with USAID Elections and Political Transitions Division. Thank you very much for uh, uh, your work. And uh, in many, many cases, your courageous work, really, in where you put your lives at risk. And in cases where democracy is already safeguarded, let's not forget that we should never take it for granted, uh, not just in your countries, but in our own country and everywhere, really, globally, as we can see. Uh, so thank you for being here and for doing this work. Work. From the USAID's perspective, and I just re returned from a trip to Mongolia, actually, where we're thinking about designing a youth program, um, two things. First, let me just say how impressed I was by the youth in Mongolia and how active they were, at least in a context in which I saw them. And yes, they're not engaged, broadly speaking, in politics, and there's only, there was only one youth parliamentarian in, uh, in, the par in the current parliament, and he stepped out. Um, but the few people or the few organizations that I did see active were extremely active. In fact, in the last presidential election, the I was not so impressed in terms of the direction it took, but um, the white or the blank ballot movement, which was a spontaneous uh, movement, that pretty much encouraged people, you know, youth was so disillusioned with the politicians or what was offered that basically they encouraged young people to cast a, a blank ballot. They were so successful that there were 10,000 votes away from invalidating the election. Mm. So this is a very, very active youth. So question number one, do you believe, particularly in Mongolia, that this movement kind of not necessarily scared but spoke to politicians please take us seriously mm -hmm. you know so because we are here and we were 10,000 votes away from invalidating this election that's question number two that is more specific question number two that is a bit more broad towards everyone is um, from the point of view of a donor agency what do you believe are the new adapt uh, adapted methods and methodologies you know how should we reach youth most effectively. Um, I was very interested again in what you said, well, public hearings, these traditional conferences, again, when I was in Mongolia doing the assessment, people were like, we're not interested in conferences and just sitting around and talking all day. Just give us something that is more vibrant, more dynamic, just talk to us. And the TED, is it TED Talks? 
Is it uh, a new creative entertainment uh, programs? Uh, how do we reach youth? How do we activate youth most effectively with the new, considering everything, uh, uh, just sort of like the new digital age, let's call it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe Dolgion could respond to both, but Pedro maybe. Mm -hmm. And so before that, let's go to the second question. Thank you. James Tyler from uh, Community for Creative Nonviolence. Um, I'm actually from Bogota, Colombia, so my question is directed towards Pedro. Uh, given your research done throughout indigenous municipalities in Colombia, what would you attribute, I mean, what we've seen in the past year, starting with the protests in Medellin as a uprising against President Duque's administration, which many people see as a throwback to the Uribe administration, the pre um, peace agreements talks that had taken place. Um, it's been known that Duque was opposed to the peace agreement and has taken um, measures to sort of roll back some of the reforms that were done. I think up to maybe 300 <coughs> uh, social leaders were assassinated or died mysteriously in mainly in indigenous areas um, trying to sort of uphold parts of the peace agreement. What do you attribute that, I mean, the role of civic and youth civic engagement in those, because what we've seen is, I think, indigenous peoples have had have played a significant role in those uprisings, including I think the the um, forms of protest with the beating of the drums, pots, pans, um, which is a traditional form of um, protest, as I understand, in that region. I wonder what would you attribute that? Um, what would you attribute the role on that? Thank you. So Dolgian, would you like to respond to the first question? Sure. Thank you very much for bringing up the case of the white ballot movement. So what happened is that during the presidential election last year uh, in 2017, the political parties in power in parliament, they have to propose candidates for which from which we have to select, but all candidates were all flawed in different ways, in corruption or high levels of populism, etc. So the entire population was very upset with, and they were thinking, is this democracy? If we have to choose between the given three very unpopular candidates, in that case, we don't want this kind of democracy. Maybe we need a strong hand. So this is where the direction was going to, which is po posed a lot of threats to democracy we have. But suddenly what happened is that um, a legal specialist pointed out to one of the uh, websites, person also, uh, public news agent, that you know what, there's an option in our election law to cast the white ballot and to um, include, to count your vote, but at the same time not select anyone, to reject it. It worked very well in presidential election because each candidate had to get above 51% in order to be set as president. So there, I, there was a minimum criteria. So that's why the white ballot could have worked if many people have voted to no one. Each political party had to propose new candidates, although it's costly. So that's why there was a big sign of hope and people suddenly thought they have an option to participate in the choice. So that's why it took a lot of, uh, uh, by expectation, 10% of all the votes, nearly 10% was white ballot. It almost put the current president below that threshold. And I have to say, majority of the voters were not only the youth, it was people in urban slums. People the urban youth or the some elite groups like to say, oh, they like they uh, sell their votes. Those people very much themselves white uh, voted white ballot. So what it tells us is this legitimacy issue I'm talking about again. As soon as people are given choice, they feel like they can uh, select their voice, their participation increase, and uh, regardless of the group. Uh, whereas what we have now is democracy, but within very limited corrupt or some kind of uh, separate system. So I think it's a great example to use also internationally that when 
uh, youth are given voice, they can be active participants. And this is a youth-led movement very much. So uh, this also shows we still have power and nobody imagined this would go this far, but it did. But now what we're doing with the white ballot movement is not to encourage white, because the general election is different. If people start voting white ballot, it would be very messy. So now the movement is slightly changing strategy and saying, go and vote mm -hmm. for the youth who have not been involved in corruption before. So this base that we already gained is now being used for a different purpose and adapting to changing situation. I think it's a great. Do you or anyone else have a response to the other question about innovations on the part of donors in order to better connect to the younger generation? What more creative, innovative programs could be initiated from the international community to better resonate with the youth. Mm -hmm. Would you like to respond to that? Um, Pedro and Victoria, okay. I want to recall what Marvi said about DFID. Marvi, yes, DFID. Yes, DFID yeah. and Malala case, yeah. mm -hmm. where donors can change goalposts depending on what mm -hmm. suits them and what the establishment wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think we are coming to a time where uh, with especially with the youth bulge, use of communication and technology, we cannot start playing games, yeah? Mm -hmm. People can read through the actions and the motives of, of certain players. And I think uh, that's where donors have to be very careful and think twice how they engage with governments. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as much as they want to respect the sovereignty of states, and as much as they feel dealing with issues of democracy and governance are not in their mandates. I think the, the working in silos or trying to separate their activities in, in humanitarian support, in social services, in health, in education, away from democracy, rights, and governance issues is, uh, is uh, it's a misfit. It doesn't work because the within that context, they interrelate inter 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 and they're integrated. You can't have a context that's not peaceful and think you will do your work. So what I would like us to do is go back to the drawing board. And you may not be very vocal on issues of governance and democracy, but realize that if you bring in the youth and social services and health and sexual and reproductive health, that is indirectly or directly linked to the issues of human rights and governance. So when you go on the table, around the table with governments, it's high time beyond the milestones and indicators that you request for and the benchmarks before triggers or funding and all that. The issues of democracy and governance are key because you cannot sustain your work and your engagement in a certain country if those uh, principles are not adhered to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go Just ahead. to quickly add on the innovative method, we did a nationwide survey among, uh, like I mentioned, social well-being and asked everybody which group do they belong to or which activity they participate in the last one year. And majority of the youth, like I mentioned, didn't participate in many uh, like land association, religious groups or anything we can imagine. But the only two things they participated more than the other age groups was music and sports. Not surprisingly, mm. of course. And uh, we tried last year also some events with youth uh, in which there was music and a little bit of competition and not these kind of chairs, but an open room, open space. And the format seemed to people really like. So I think w the donors or people should galvanize on these interests of the youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, uh, can I? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think um, there can be many ways, uh, for example, in Pakistan, our challenge is to involve youth from different segments of society, uh, from different um, uh, classes. Uh, and uh, for that, I'd say the all the donor programs, which are on different issues, uh, need to incorporate youth uh, engagement aspect. That would be a service. For example, there are a bunch of programs on agriculture. 
the uh, the farmers education programs new techniques for agriculture why can't they involve young farmers and young farmers would mean women and men both because in farming community women in pakistan are participating in agriculture um, uh, more than men are basically uh, but their labor force their inclusion in this agricultural labor force is not being recognized by the state they do not reflect women's work uh, in agriculture as the labor force surveys uh, so uh, so uh, the point is that all programs uh, that involve working with the rural communities and with the urban communities with educated people with people who are semi educated or illiterate uh, the people uh, the vocational training programs they need to incorporate young people uh, civic education programs obviously they are already focused on young people there needs to be um, uh, th there need to be a civic education program beyond the universities and colleges as well because um, the people who can vote can also learn about i mean they the voting rights are not um, conditional upon your education level so people there are people who do not uh, know how to read and write but they do have an opinion so they, they that big huge resource needs to be tapped also about innovative programs also uh, i think uh, one thing that has happened that that has uh, been successful in other um, uh, other countries uh, can also be uh, you know the inspiration the we lack uh, role models in our society especially women role models role models in democracy um, uh, um, we have many role models but they are not since they have pitched themselves against the state so they are considered to be anti state so they, they do not have popular um, uh, um, popular appeal as they should have so these inspirational people should be um, brought by international partners can do it they can brought uh, they can be brought in to speak to the groups of the young people. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, people, uh, young people in Pakistan would be fascinated to host Francis Fukuyama, for example. Uh, so the, the people from, from the, uh, the world uh, who have done, uh, who have worked hard for democracy and democratic values um, should engage with, uh, with them and the international organizations can be one conduit for that. It's a tricky question because you have, for instance, in Pakistan, young role models like Malala, but for some reason, yeah, for that's what of I said. Yeah. They, the people have become dis much of the people, not all, of course, have distanced themselves from her. So, do mm. you think that is the responsibility of the international community? No, no, it's not the responsibility. But since since the international community wants to engage and are asking how innovatively we can engage. Yeah. So that was the response of it. Nothing in our country's responsibility of in, uh, yeah. international community. It's us, who basically it's the civil society and the government. How to reclaim the, the narrative yeah. to promote a more yeah. positive image of yeah, so, so the basic responsibility ours. Places. But since the question came in, yeah. how international community be more you know, productive innovative, and innovative? Yeah. Uh, so that was, uh, so my Thank suggestion you. was in, in response Thank to you. that. So before I invite Victoria and Pedro to respond, I want to see if we have any other questions from the audience. If Do we have any other questions from the audience? If not, then I will invite um, Victoria to respond to the question from USAID and Pedro to respond to that, as well as the question from James. And then we will conclude our conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. And I would like to respond to, uh, to a question. I'm sorry, it wouldn't be strictly about the innovation, but uh, one remark about the um, donor approach to Kazakhstan. It's not only about the USAID, but the donor community um, in general. Because before talking about the innovation, my, uh, my vision is that the donor community should change the approach to Kazakhstan in principle. Because for the time being, we have a really big issue when the donor community encourage the pro-democracy NGOs to build a partnership and dialogue only with, with the government inside of the country. Unfortunately, the donors slightly support the program which are aimed at building the dialogue connection between pro-democracy NGOs and community at large with the population, with the youth. 
So uh, I'll give you one example. When I joined Freedom House in 2013, we had a program, by the way, find a, uh, funded by USAID, uh, when we tried to help the government to follow the international commitments. But we did it through our NGO partner network in, in the country and did it you know, pretty traditional way when we funded our partners and they made monitoring, reporting, and development of recommendation to the government. We made this program three or four years, and then we've discovered that this program didn't bring any meaningful results for, th for the society because there were no improved piece of le legislation, there were no improved enforce uh, law enforcement, nothing. So we started thinking about reshifting the focus of the program from the government to the society and to build the connection between human rights uh, community and civic, uh, you know, uh, community with the people in order to raise more uh, active uh, citizens who start demanding their rights rather than writing recommendation to the government, which is unfortunately not responsive to this recommendation. So I would really recommend to think about the Dawn approach to, you know, some concrete countries, including Kazakhstan and to help us to be regularly, I mean, when I, when I say us, I mean um, internal NGOs community, pro-democracy community, to be on regular engagement with the youth, including with support from, from your side. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then finally, Pedro, if you could respond to both this question and then the question from Colombia. Okay, I will start with, with the question from, because I also appreciate the I mean, the, the question, because sometimes we implement projects and we also have some thoughts about this. So I think there are two things to, to think about. The first one is a method issue. And I would suggest we sh you should uh, switch from the moment to the process. So for example, uh, a common concept used in, in international cooperation is a workshop or a training session which is a moment. But that training session should work for a process. We need youth engaged. So I think that probably uh, to think about a process, a mid-term process more than the specific workshop could be interesting. And also I think there's a, um, a problem with the scale. Sometimes the international cooperation agencies think about countries. And when you think about countries, you th in, in, the, in my case it would be, I don't know, Bogota. So we need youth engagement in Colombia. So Bogota is, is, is the point where the most important public and private forces get. So to, to create or to reach a change there is so hard. I would uh, start or I would put my efforts in a smaller scale where the, the public, the private and, and the civil society interests are could could go in the same direction in an easy way uh, so i mean i, I think that's th th that's the that would be my my thoughts on that turn to the to the question about colombia i mean it's huge the problem but i would summarize in in this way colombian uh, society is divided between one hypothesis which is we are we have an armed conflict and we have to give political participation to guerrilla groups for getting a peaceful country. That's the first one. The other one says we need a peaceful country, but we, ne we need to put the guerrilla members at justice before getting political power or participation. So the previous president, the former president, uh, uh, suggested the first hypothesis. And the president we have now is, uh, I mean, supports the second hypothesis. So now we have a lot of riots, we have a lot of protests, and that's the, like the political moment. But I also wanted to share that I'm really proud of what is happening in Colombia now, because I think we have a really a strong civil society. So for example, if there is repression from the police, we have the indigenous guard, no? which is a kind of a civil police uh, uh, conformed by indigenous people that then came to the protest to protect people, which is also very interesting. If there is, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to say this, but during the last three weeks, 19 journalists were in jail or arrested. But we have FLIP. We have my organization that is able and that has a loud voice for, for them to be released soon. So, I mean, so, some things bad are happening, but we also have 
a strong civil society organizations that are able to face and to compete and, 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 and to claim and, and, and to, to raise for our rights, which is also that I look in, in, in other countries is, is quite different. Thank you, Pedro. Um, so we are drawing to the end of our time together. I would like to just canvas our speakers to see if anybody would like to make any statements in conclusion. If not, I want to thank all of you for your patience and your engagement, and especially to thank each one of you, our speakers, for being such a dynamic group. We are incredibly proud of you as fellows, and you are terrific ambassadors for your countries and your causes, which ultimately all reflect your own commitment to deepening civic participation in your countries. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.